Hello, welcome to our second week of our series called Fully Alive. That's for Sunday, uh, April 26th. And before we do that, let me do a couple of announcements. Number one, there is a leadership class that we are doing. We're in our second week. And if you'd like to join us for that, join us on our Zoom account. And you can get more information about that from our website. And then if you're struggling financially or you could use some supplies, we could help you with that. You might be wondering how I can find this information. Well, there's a variety of ways of doing that. You can review these announcements or connect with us on our website at jbf7.net. You can make contact with us through our Facebook page, or you can use the phone number, which is 319-827-6231. And then if you'd like to make a donation, you can do that on our website, or you can send a check to our address, Jessup Bible Fellowship, P.O. Box 268, Jessup, Iowa, 50648. Also, if you'd like to get a hold of me, you can do that as well. You can do that via my cell phone, 507-251-9800. And then there's the email, that is jbfpastor at jtt.net. And um, yeah, get a hold of me. And so now, let's go on to the message. Hi, and welcome back to our second week of Fully Alive, living in the aftermath of the resurrection. So we've been studying the book of Acts. and. The disciples at first had a little bit of a hard time figuring out how to do this life without Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit shows up. They win 3,000 people over to Christ in one day. And then they started building this community where they were building each other up in the Word. They were hanging out with each other in each other's homes. They were, they were sharing in communion. And, and there was these effects that were happening because of this. People were filled with awe and wonder. They're, they were seeing miracles, and people were coming to Christ just daily. It was happening. And so they, they even did things like they, they sold their stuff, the, the extra things that they had, and would share with each other the extra amount that they had. It was an amazing time for the church. And I think what Luke is trying to do is he's trying to help us understand how to live in the wake of the resurrection and, and how that changes everything. So we're going we're gonna to study that and, and look at what uh, Luke and what Acts is trying to tell us. We're going to Acts chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at that section of scripture and using that story to prompt us in some more things about what Luke is trying to tell us. And while you look that up, um, I, I've just been thinking and praying for you. You know, with all the news, uh, it can be depressing about hearing all the stories of the COVID-19 outbreak. It can be a downer to be stuck in your home and not be able to connect with anybody. Uh, hearing about the side effects of the pandemic and how it's shutting down our economy, well, that can just get scary. And so I've been asking myself, like, what can I do to help everyone who's listening kind of see the sense of hope, uh, see what it means to live in the aftermath of the resurrection? Now, you might be thinking and hoping that I'm going to talk to you about, well, because Jesus died and rose again, we all have hope. And we all have joy. But I, I want to go past that. I, I want to go deeper than that because I think the book of Acts actually demonstrates to us how we can find hope and joy in a situation like what we face today. So if you're hoping that I'm just going to talk about hope and joy, that's not where I'm going. I'm going into a way of life that that fills us with life, that we live fully alive. And so I think the story that we're about to read now is perfect for this. So we're in Acts chapter three, we'll start at verse one, and let's just read. It says, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, 
where he was put every day to beg for those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. And so the man gave them his attention, expecting something from them. Then Peter said, gold or silver I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. <laughs> Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Isn't that an amazing story? I, I love that story. And can you picture that scene? Like, it's just another day. Peter and John are going up to the temple to pray, like they always do, at 3 p.m. And, and so at, at the same time, this man knows that since everybody's going to go to the temple at 3 to pray, he positions himself outside one of the key gates, the beautiful gate, and he positions himself there strategically to be able to ask people for money, which is how he gets an income. Now, later on, Luke points out in chapter 4, that this man was like 40 years old. Now think of the number of times that he had sat at the same gate doing the same thing and seeing the same people as, as they walked in through the gate to go pray. So this is just part of his routine. And I bet a lot of people didn't know his name. They just, they just knew him as the lame guy at, at the beautiful gate. And I bet this guy had his begging down to a system. I, I bet he, he knew how to get people's attention. And, and he gets Peter and John's attention. And so they stop and they look at him. And then they ask, well, Peter says, look at me. And this guy's like, oh, this guy's gonna give me some money. <laughs> I love, this is a quotable quote, isn't it? Silver and gold, well, I don't have any of that but what I do have, I'm going to give you. And what Peter gives him is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He gives them the power that flows from the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it changes everything. You know what? I'm envious of that kind of power. Can you imagine? what it would be like to be able to walk around, put your hands on people, and heal them instantly. Even with all of our technology, even with all the medicines and, and all the medications, the, all the things that we have, rarely does a doctor walk in and just wave a magic wand and poof, the person is better the next day. But Peter, Peter puts his hands on this guy, reaches down, pulls him up, and from that moment on, this man is fully healed. The scariest thing about COVID-19 is that we have no idea how to fix it. And that's really rare for us to have a major sickness going around where we don't have any idea how to turn it around. When there's a major kind of sickness, usually we find some way to deal with it and, and turn it around. And so right now it's kind of scary that we don't have anything. It's unnerving that we, the only way for us to, to deal with this is to hide in our homes and wait for it to go away. Wouldn't it be nice to have the power to change that? Wouldn't it be awesome if, if you could just walk around and make it go away? Well, I'm envious of that power. I wish I had it. And sometimes what I do is I focus on what I don't have. I don't have the power to fix it. 
I, I, it's just nothing I could do about it. And because I focus on that, I don't live fully alive. I live flat and blah and, and lost. What I need to do is I need to focus on what I do have. And Peter says, I don't have money, but I do have Jesus. And so because of Jesus, get up, be healed. I, I turn that backwards. I, I want to give people that kind of power. Uh, that would be awesome. You know, forget the money. Give me the power. But, but God hasn't given me that power. He has given me money. And so what am I going to do with that? I focus on what I don't have rather than what I do have. I, I can love people. I have love. I, I can give people time. I have time. I, I can give them money. I do have at least some money. And I do have Jesus. Now, I, so far, Jesus hasn't chosen to do wild, crazy miracles through me but I do have Jesus, and I can tell them the way. So why do I try to offer what I don't have when I could offer what I do have? And am I willing to offer what I do have? Because there's this temptation I have to hoard what Jesus has given me. You know, stash it in the bank, keep it for myself. Am I going to be the type of person that shares and that offers people what I do have? Here's what I've noticed about Luke as he describes the church, the kingdom of God, in his book of Acts. This is a group of people who are connected with each other and connected with the Holy Spirit. They're empowered because they love each other, they love Jesus, and the Spirit is working through them. And so they love people outside the church. They, they overflow that love to them. And, and then they, they share. They, they sell their stuff. And they, they give it. Why? Because the stuff isn't important to them. They, they have what they need. And they, they share Jesus. They share boldly. Despite this massive resistance, they love people enough to share. Jesus. And God gives us all kinds of things. He gives us resources. He gives us, he gives us, I mean, think of all the stuff that we have in our homes, plus the money that we have in our accounts. And sometimes when we hoard, we, we feel the weight of that stuff rather than feeling the joy of that stuff. Why? Because God gave it to us, not so that we could hang on to it, but so that we could share it. Well, anyway, what Peter does is Peter hands out this free sample of the kingdom of God. <laughs> and, and this guy's like, this is awesome. Uh, Peter stretches out his hand, lifts this guy up, and this guy, this guy's legs respond, and he is jumping and yelling. I, I picture him doing this thing where he's running circles around Peter and John, yelling at the top of his lungs, I'm healed, I'm healed, and just, just telling people because he is so thrilled. Now, here's what we probably forget. There's a rule, and the rule is if, if you're broken, if if you're not whole, you can't go into the temple. This man had sat outside the temple for 40 years, and because he had been born with this deformity, he had never, never been in the temple. Yeah, there's this rule in Leviticus 21, and this is what it says. It says, no man who has any defect may come near meaning in the temple. No man who is blind or lame, disfigured, deformed, no man with a crippled foot or hand. 
And so this man had never been in the temple. And now, for the first time, this man not only walks into the temple, he comes leaping and screaming into the temple. <laughs> and here's another thing that we might forget. It's 3 p.m. It's the time for prayer. Now, can you imagine someone running into church in the middle of our prayers, jumping, yelling, running around, screaming, I've been healed? That might attract a little attention, right? And this man attracts attention. And so Peter and John are now the center of attention with this man. So let's pick up the story right where we left off at verse 11. At verse 11, it says this, While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare, as if, stare at us as if our own, by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the, the Holy One, the Righteous One, and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. Oh, wow, can you imagine saying that? But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know has, has been made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him as you all see. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that this Christ would suffer. Repent then, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus, he must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on as many as have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Though your offspring, or I'm sorry, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So Peter launches in to this speech because he is the center of attention. He, th this guy has brought all the attention on him. And Peter takes advantage of that to say, look, I'm just, I'm just the messenger. Don't, don't glorify the messenger. Glorify the one who did it, and that's Jesus. Now, you killed him, <laughs> but he rose again, and that kind of power is evidence this man right here. So what happens here is that Peter has a missions mindset. Some, some would call it a missional mentality. Now, what is a missional mentality? It, the newer churches, the churches that have just started, often talk about missional, a missional mindset. And let me just define that for you. A missional mindset is an attitude and a lifestyle that says, I'm an undercover missionary sent here to be with you so that I can love you and serve you and share Jesus with you. That's the mission of my life. That's a missional attitude. And the C-19 crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, is an incredible opportunity for us to be missional. Yeah, we, we, we can't bring people to church, but we can bring church to people. 
we can bring this fully alive mentality into people's lives by serving like what Peter did. Now, Peter had the power to just place his hands on this man and heal him. We might not have that power, but that doesn't mean we can't serve. Doesn't mean that we can't make a difference. Doesn't mean that we can't experience the joy and the fulfillment of reaching into people's lives and transforming them. Now, I, I will tell you that you guys are being really creative already. The women's group, like every day, they're getting online and encouraging each other and praying with each other. There's, there's a prayer time on, on the Zoom app every Sunday night. Like, join us for that. Let's start praying. Let's start thinking about ways that we can reach out to people. And then, like, there's people who are close to you that have needs. That this whole virus thing is creating all kinds of needs. Let's take advantage of that. And let's be creative. So, what is it that God is calling you to do? I'm, I'm asking everyone to get involved. Everyone to be thinking with a missional mindset that says, I can do something. I can do something to affect the world around me. I can bring hope somehow. There's something I can do. And when we start thinking that way, there's an energy that happens inside of us. When we start making a difference in other people's lives, there's a life that happens inside of us too. And I want that for you. So, here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm gonna close this video with a prayer. I'm gonna pray that God uses us. And when I'm done, I want you to get out a sheet of paper and I want you to actually write down some ideas, to actually start thinking this way, to, to start praying. Like, write yourself a note, put it on the bathroom mirror, and every morning, pray that God gives you an opportunity to do something to impact people's lives. And then get ready, because <laughs> God, God loves those kinds of prayers, doesn't he? All right, so if you're alone, get out a sheet of paper, Write out some ideas. If, if you're with family or if you're with some kind of group, have a discussion right after this video. Talk about some ways that, that you can make a difference. And then get ready to do it. Get out there and make a difference. And be fully alive. Let's pray. Father, While we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. He died, he rose again, and he showed us this way of being fully alive. He is the example of reaching into people's lives and making a difference. Ah, oh, we've become passive. We've, we've allowed ourselves to sit back and do nothing. And I pray that we would be a people who are not content to sit back and do nothing, that our hearts would burn with a desire to make a difference, and that there would be the sense of joy and fullness in our lives because we are doing that for you. May you be honored and glorified in what we do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, this is the time to sit down and think. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again next week.